Good morning, everyone. This is Nick Gibson. I'm going to try to help you this morning um, engage in some personal devotions relative to some of the scriptures we're going to be doing on Sunday mornings. The purpose of what we call um, personal devotions or a devotional time is to fuel devotion. Imagine your love and desire for God emotionally, your your internal drive and motivation to love God and your feeling that you do love God is like a fire. That human beings emotionally, those that fire naturally burns lower when we're not engaging in the thing that we care about. Um, the Bible says in Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep up your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That is, God puts on us the responsibility <clears throat> to take what he's given us about himself, all of the beautiful and motivating and profound truths that he's revealed and spoken about himself, that we need to take those in and let those be fuel to an emotional fire inside of us for God, so that our, our devotion and our zeal to him and to do what's good and beautiful in his name is always burning bright. There's always real heat coming from it in our, in our lives. So <clears throat> what I'm doing right now is not preaching a sermon. This is not a sermon video, it's a tutorial. My goal is to try to take you through and to help you um, understand how to do a devotional and, and, and to sort of build up our skills to do that in this time where we have a lot of personal time where we could do this if we shut off the TV and we spend some time seeking God during um, the, uh, the virus <clears throat> um, sequestration. So, um, one of the things you'll see here is I have laid this out in relationship to the sentence structure. To the sentence structure of the passage. So, you'll see, therefore is here. And then you see, I'll ind I indent here with the preposition, indent here with the preposition, prepositional phrase. Now, I'm indenting the prepositional phrase here because this prepositional phrase is modifying this word grace, right? And so you'll see, I'll bring it back out when, even though this is a conjunction and, I'm going to bring that back out here because this doesn't modify this. It's a third, it's a third thing. So there's justified by faith, having peace with God, and rejoicing in the hope of the glory. Those are three things. And these two, these statements here are modifying the second thing or explaining it, right? You'll see this as we work through. And so <clears throat> you'll see that, that that's why I have these indents and I've laid it out this way. You don't have to do that. I just try to do it for clarity's sake. The next thing to think about is, what are we looking at here? You see that we're looking at Romans 5.11. Now, one of the questions to ask is, well, what is Romans 5.11, right? And the answer is, Romans 5.11 is an epistle. That is a letter written from the apostle to a church. It's written to the church at Rome, the city of Rome. It was passed throughout the church at Rome for people to read and was read aloud to them in worship services. And so we have basically one side of a phone conversation right? That is, sometimes we'll have to figure out what the other side would have said. Or, because in many cases, the way the apostle's going to go, he's, he's going to go one direction or another based on what he thinks is happening and the people who would be listening. And so, we're not exactly like the people who are listening. And the objections or the questions that we might have as we read might not be exactly the same as the questions of the people in the first century, right? <clears throat> and so, by understanding why he's doing what he's doing, um, we'll understand the epistle better. And by that, we need to realize we're only listening to one side of a conversation, right? Now, it's also important that when you go through a passage like this, because Romans is actually a fairly difficult passage um, or epistle, and it's important to recognize, especially in personal devotions, that you don't have to understand everything to get something out of a passage. So you could go through a passage like this that's relatively difficult in a way, and you could just get a couple of things out of it and not understand. You could you could miss 95% of what's there. But if you take a spiritual log of devotion to God to throw on your fire, and it increases your spiritual devotion to God, you appreciate God more, what he's done for you more, you love him more, you feel like you know him better, you've invested in that relationship, and that relationship is burning hotter rather than cooling off then you're doing what's what's what what the goal of personal devotion is. Does that make sense? Now, that doesn't mean that studying a passage like this is a purely emotional event. <clears throat> we have to use our minds and analytically look at what's actually going on here so we know that the devotional thing we're getting out of it is true. Right? And so it's this is a combination of a mental exercise and a sharpening of our minds and a um, a feeding of our hearts in God. 
right? So we want to make sure that we focus on what the argument of the passage is and what it's saying. Now, um, why are we looking at verses 11, 1 to 11? And the answer is, is because we're going to look at a passage. Now you might say, well, what is that? Well, in and up in like a gospel where we're reading about the acts of Jesus, right? We would look at one complete story, not just one verse or a couple of verses, but we'd read the whole story. We try to make sense of the whole story first and then make sense of the verses inside of it. That gives us what, what we just call context, right? We know the context in which something's happening and we understand why it's functioning that way. In an epistle like this where it's discourse, right? The apostle is just writing content. We want to break down a portion of the argument. All of Romans is going to be one big, long, sustained argument where the apostle is trying to tell us a bunch of things and they're in their relationship to each other. Well, we can't look at the whole book of Romans in our devotions, but we can choose not to look at just one verse where we might not understand the context at all. What we're going to do is we're going to look at 11 verses so that we'll get a good a good share of the context so we can understand the verses that we're looking at. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's look at the passage. Let's start by reading it. And sometimes it's best to read it a few times. Sometimes I'll read a passage three or four times before I really start breaking it down. But we're going to read it just once. Let's read it together. Therefore, <clears throat> since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only, not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So the first question we should ask ourselves is, do we know what this passage is about as a whole? Well, I think it should be something that because of this thing called justification, our relationship with God is a lot better and is very stable. In some sense, this passage is about what, what Christians sometimes call assurance. That is, that you can know you're standing with God. But it's not just that. It's a bunch of other things, too. So let's try to break it down. So let's start here. First of all, you see this, this word right here, right? Therefore. Now, what does that assume? Well, there's kind of a joke um, that's really corny, but is also memorable. That whenever you find a therefore, look and see what it's there for. Right? If this word exists, it means that something in, before it is very important in order to understand what we're looking at now. If you look back at Romans 4 and the, the second half of chapter 3, the apostle discusses this concept called justification. That if we, that Christ has died and brought in and purchased or accomplished a righteousness on our behalf. And if we believe in him, he uh, he comes into union with us, and Christ's righteousness belongs to us and is put on us, and our sin is put on him in the death of his cross, so that our sin can be wiped away and forgiven, that is atoned for, and we can be in union with Christ, and we can possess and experience the righteousness of Christ, so that before God, our status is that we are innocent of harm and crime and guilt. That is, we are justified. One way theologian says it is it's just as if I've never sinned. Right? It is the state of being completely right with God and right before God and free from the accusations of anyone before God. So no one can come into God's presence with us and accuse us of anything and be successful. We're justified. Now this, const so the first thing is, then that we've received this justification, ju we've been justified through faith. 
right? That's a key idea, right? Let's make, give that a color. So we've been justified through faith, right? So now notice this word here, since. So what this is saying is, is right, it's saying, since we've been justified by faith, something else is the case. So the next thing we're going to read is an implication of this thing Paul has been arguing for in chapters 3 and 4, which is justification. So because we've been justified, what well, we have peace with God is the second thing, right? That's not a very good color. Let's get a little bit better one. Let's do that. So we have peace with God, and then you see this, this prepositional phrase, through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So justification... Okay, just having been justified is through faith. Do you notice that? And then that's happened through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in one verse, you can actually see the gospel, right? This salvation has come through our Lord Jesus Christ and is applied to us or we receive it through faith. So through faith, we've been justified. The result of that is that we have peace with God. And that's happened through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is his death and resurrection on our behalf. Right? Now, it's going to continue to talk about our Lord Jesus Christ because it's through whom. Do you see that word there? It's important to pay attention to words like this. Because they're telling us what's going on. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace. So, it is the whom that has allowed us to gain access right? Whoops. Allowed us to gain access into what? Into grace, which, which does what? Which, in which, that is in the grace, we now stand. Now, it's important to recognize that words like grace um, are difficult because people read those and they have, they don't know exactly what they mean. And so people just go, oh yeah, grace, whatever. But grace is the free gift of God. So grace is everything related to being justified and having peace with God, but it's more than that. But the thing is, is that in this passage and in the book so far, we haven't been told exactly what that is yet. We're going to be told later. All we know right now is that it's the free gift of God. But, but here's what's important to recognize in this particular moment. Is that this grace right here, is connected to this standing here. The reason that we can stand is because we have received grace from God. That's very important. And the reason we have that grace from God is because it's been accessed by faith and through faith in Jesus Christ. And, that, and we, are, we can stand before God because we're justified. We can stand with God because we have peace with him. But we can stand, what this refers to is the ability to face our lives and what we're going to deal with in the present. It is what you might call a persevering or standing grace, right? It's the grace in which we now can deal with the present. So we've been justified from the sins of our past and made, we've made peace with God because of what we've done that would separate us from God in the past. We have the grace we've gained access to to stand in the present. And now it also and now it says we rejoice in the hope. Whoops. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Right? That's the next thing. So notice here that we're rejoicing. I should make that a different color. It should be this orange. You can see that we're rejoicing. Oh, that's not very nice, is it? That we're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, right? Now, that's useful because down here, you'll see we are going to rejoice there, right? And if you remember down here, we also rejoice in God. So, you'll notice that three times in just these 11 verses, there's a specific emphasis on our pleasure, our happiness. And it's not just that we can be generally happy, but these truths, the proper emotional effect on us, 
and the way they're meant to sustain us is that we're supposed to be able to rejoice, to be incredibly happy for that and for that happiness to flow out of us. Right? And so we rejoice in what the hope of the glory of God. Now, what's the hope of the glory of God? Well, Paul hasn't really explained that much. Theologically, from other passages, we know that what that means is that ultimately God will judge the earth and become its true and final king explicitly in a way that everybody can see in active rule and reign, and that in those days, things will be done according to God's will, and they will be amazingly great. And God will get the reputation he really deserves. That is, God will be glorified. That is, he will be <clears throat> seen for who he, and enjoyed for who he really is. And that coming glory of God, right, is a hope of ours. And it is in the hope that we are rejoicing. So see the structure here. We're being justified. We're justified. We are standing in the grace and we're rejoicing in the future hope of the coming glory of God. Okay, now, that's pretty amazing to think about heaven or the, the final state which God is all in all and that we are part of that hope because we, st we stand with God now, we've been justified, and we're at peace with him. So we're going to get to participate in that glory of God and see it ourselves. And that is something we can rejoice in, right? But now we see this here. You see that, you see that next phrase where he says, not only so. That's important. Because up until this point, <clears throat> the apostle sees us as doing review from chapters 3 and 4. And these are all highly positive things. We're justified, we have peace with God, we've gained access to grace in which we now stand, and we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Past, present, future, this is incredibly encouraging. We could feed off of these two verses the rest of our lives if we understood what all of these words really meant and they came home to our heart. And the gospel is here, through faith, in Jesus Christ, God gives us all these things. That is the good news. But then he says this, but not only so, that is, we don't only rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, we also rejoice in our sufferings. Right? Now that's, the apostle is dropping the big ball here, in our sufferings. Why? Why would we rejoice in our sufferings? That's crazy, right? And he says, well, it's because, there's a, here's the reason, it's because we know, now when he says that, he's saying that we know it theologically. We know that what? Suffering produces perseverance, right? So suffering has an effect of being productive. Now it's important to recognize here that everything in this passage that is good for us is accessed by what? How do how do, does suffering always produce perseverance? Doesn't suffering sometimes destroy people, right? And the answer here is yeah, it often destroys people. So what we need to recognize is that everything in this passage is connected to and combined with faith. So, yes, suffering produces perseverance when suffering is combined with faith. If suffering is combined with faith, it'll produce perseverance. And if it's combined with faith, that perseverance will produce long-term proven perseverance, which is character. This word means something like provenness, right? And if we have a internal provenness in character, in faith, then our relationship to hope is going to be super stable. Do you see the relationship here now between hope and hope? Right? And rejoice and rejoice. So you see how the apostle is building here? Through faith, God has done past, present, and future these things. But we don't only rejoice in this, we rejoice in this. Why? Because hope is so important. And our suffering produces more hope. So it's not just that we know that we're justified, have peace with God, are standing in present grace, and we'll someday be with God when his glory is fully revealed in rejoicing in that hope. But we can actually rejoice in whatever produces more hope. And sufferings, our sufferings, actually produce more hope. And because they produce more hope, that's weird. Because they produce more hope. Oh, I know what's going on there. I'm hitting the wrong button. Because they produce more hope. 
they actually help us. Oh man, because they, I'm just going to stay with it here. Because they produce more hope, they actually are worth it because what does hope create for us? Well, hope creates for us rejoicing. Rejoicing. That is, that fuel of devotion, the grace in which we now stand, the love of God, the enjoyment of God, knowing that we have, we're justified and have peace with God and can stand, is rooted in this joy that we feel. And that joy flows out of the hopes that we're rejoicing in. What is there to be hopeful for? In our sufferings, right? What do we do in suffering? Well, we have to look to what can give us joy in the moments of suffering. And what Paul says is that suffering is going to produce in us a character that's going to solidify our ability to see and our focus on that hope. Now, this gets to the point of where we anticipate what people are going to ask, are going to ask right? Because the, th the question you might ask here is something like, well, but what if we're stupid? Like, like what if we haven't experienced that hope? We're hoping for something we haven't seen yet. And what if it turns out that, that these, this hope is completely vain, right? And so he says, and hope does not, oops, and hope does not disappoint us. This word disappoint means something like um, shame or humiliation, right? So the question is, is this hope going to be solid, right? And so his next point is, right, this is the next point, that hope is, that our hope is not going to disappoint us. Right? That's the next key. Now, if you're working through this at, in personal devotions, right, when you, you get to the end of the chapter, now, for the first day, you might just look at this first section and say, okay, I can actually take away quite a lot from this first section, right? Through faith and through our Lord Jesus Christ, God has justified me. That is, he's made me free from accusation in his present presence so that there's nothing between him and I there's no conflict between his moral character, his righteousness, and his love for me as his valued person, right? Secondly, we have peace with God. Because we've been justified, our relationship with God is marked by peace. And that's happened through our Lord Jesus Christ, namely we learned in the earlier chapters, through his death and resurrection he brought it about, right? Through whom, Jesus Christ, we've gained access by faith into grace that allows us to stand today. You have the grace, the gift of God, the help from God in the present moment to stand in faith in Jesus Christ and to be his and to be God's. <clears throat> and in that status, you also have the promise by which you can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The day is coming where all of God's beauty and goodness will be displayed it will be all in all. It will be all around us, and we will be part of it. And that is a future hope that we can rejoice in now. And because that's true, because hope produces more joy because of the coming future glory of God, and because it reminds us of what God has already done for us in the grace we have to stand now, therefore, we can also rejoice in our sufferings because we know what they produce. They produce more hope and hope doesn't disappoint us. Okay, I think that's where we're going to stop for this first video, and then we're going to push on from five further in our next videos.